you be in here as we uh, continue in a series called Waiting in Wonder. And, uh, and so, uh, have you ever been a part or experienced a special birth? Now, I know that all babies that are born are special. Amen, right? We know that. Your baby is special. But I'm talking about one that brings a lot of joy to not just the parents, but, but a number of people around them for various reasons. Maybe like a, a couple who's gone through a long season of infertility, and then they were able to conceive, and they've been waiting for this baby for a long time. Maybe like a baby that um, was uh, born into a family. It's the first grandchild on both sides, you know, one of those experiences like that. Uh, or like this, one of our pastors this last week, his wife Kayla, uh, Pastor Will and, and, and Kayla had their precious baby girl, girl, Eleanor. There she is right there. Look, I praise, let's clap for them today. They had their, we rejoice with them. You need to know she's, she's, she's really special. Uh, you need to keep praying for her. Her lungs aren't quite developed. But she is the only girl in that family. She has three older brothers. She is going to be very well protected, wouldn't you say? Uh, but it's one of those kind of kind of babies like that. And I, I was thinking uh, a little bit about whenever my son Luke, 27 years ago, when Luke was born. And uh, it's crazy to think that. Uh, by the way, he's serving in uh, the military, serving in the U.S. Navy. He'll be home tomorrow night for Christmas. He gets home at midnight. I'm excited to see him. And uh, he'll get to be here with us for about a week. And then he goes to Japan for about a year and a half. And so we're really excited to get to spend Christmas with him this year. It's special. But I was thinking this week about, about when, a, when a baby that is born, how special it is and the joy. When Luke was born... Uh, I was a youth pastor at that time uh, of a church that was in the area. We had a pretty good sized youth group. And Luke also was the firstborn on, uh, first grandbaby on both sides of my family as well as Hope's family. And so at the hospital, as Luke is getting ready to be born, it's me and my family and Hope, some of Hope's family. There were about 20 kids from our youth group that decided to come up. We were that family that the nurses hated. Okay, sorry, those of you nurses, they had to run us out because they, we got a little rowdy. And so we had friends, family, kids that were there celebrating. And, and I just remember how special. And, and now when Luke was born, I got to just be real with you. And I would say it if he was here. He knows this. Man, whenever I first saw him, I was kind of like, yikes. Okay, he, did, he wasn't a, a handsome baby. We'll say that. Okay, um, I thought maybe Hope had given birth to an elf because his ear was crimped down. Now, it did work itself out. It just took a little time. He had, his hands were doing something weird. It looked like he was flashing baby gang signs or something. I don't know. It was really weird. But I remember holding Luke, and I remember holding Luke, and, uh, and I got to let y'all know what I did, okay? So I've got, I've got a, little, a little baby up here. I got to let y'all know that in the first service this morning, I dropped this baby. Uh, no joke. <laughs> Some of you are like, you got to do it in the next service. I could not manufacture again what I actually did. The whole thing goes flying. Baby goes flying. I've had moms that have come up to me who are pregnant saying, you can dedicate our babies. You can't hold our babies. And I'm like, okay. I was a linebacker. I was not a running back. I fumble. But I remember holding Luke. Okay. I got to hold on this time. I remember holding Luke and I remember thinking this baby is, is so special. Every baby that you have, right? They're special. And it causes this joy. And I remember thinking, you are loved by many who don't even know you yet. You don't know them, but they love you already. And you're going to be treasured by many. And because, and I remember about six months, i got to be real careful, this is where I did it, okay? I remember about six months later, I'm feeding Luke early one morning, uh, and it's early, and I'm holding him like that, and I'm just so blown away that he's my son, and what a special little boy he is. And I remember thinking this as I was holding him, son, <laughs> I'm talking to him, by the time you are two years old, you are you are going to need to be delivered from thinking that you are the center of the universe. And I am the very one who would do that as his father, right? Many times I would say, Luke, I am your father. Turn from the dark side. Do you know how many times he's heard that throughout his lifetime still, okay? But, but because he was the first grandbaby on both sides of the family, not only was he going to be loved, he was going to be what? spoiled, which is every grandparent's prerogative, right? To be able to do this. But I just want you to know that 
that whenever we had Luke, and of course when we had Trinity too, there were just so many that celebrated that with us. And it was just such a joyful occasion whenever this happened. And, and I remember, uh, you know, babies being born are special, but there are some that are really special. I remember coming home from a long haul flight from Southeast Asia, and there was a family that, a, a young couple that was on that flight, and they, they had a, a baby girl. And uh, it was clear that they had, there was an international adoption that was happening. And I remember getting there. And when we walked into the area after going through customs, I was just watching them the whole time. They were so filled with joy. There were a group of people that were there. They had signs. There was a sign that said, welcome home, Isabel. I remember when they walked through, people were clapping for them. And I was like, me? I'm home? No, it wasn't for me. It was for for this baby girl that had been long awaited, that was a special baby they had been waiting for. And it, there's just, you know, there's something. I want you to hold on to that kind of feeling about others rejoicing and experiencing the joy of the moment that a long awaited child has come. We're going to continue looking in Luke chapter 1. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles there with me. And we're in this Christmas series called Waiting and Wonder. And if you weren't here a few weeks ago, now we had our grand opening last week, and so I did a little bit of a different kind of message. But I want to go back to the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. I want us to talk about them just a little bit more and kind of wrap up their story, even in this Christmas season, because I think it's really important that we understand what God did in their lives as we also are waiting in wonder. This couple, if you don't know about them, they were, the scripture calls them this, very old. The scripture says in the ESV a little nicer, they were advanced in years. But the point is that the scripture makes is that they were past childbearing years. They had gone through decades of disappointment. They had been waiting off, often and wondering if if God had forgotten them, had they been abandoned, had, had you know, and, and there was a lot of shame in that culture that would go along with, with those who didn't have children. And they, they had even probably given up hope because of their age that, that this child would ever happen. And I want you to see that they conceive this child and, and, he, and, and he is a miracle baby. And here's where we pick up in our story. And I want you to look with me in verse 57. And this is what the scripture says. When it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son. And when her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been very, all right, help me out. What does it say? Very what? Merciful. That's an important word we'll come back to in a moment. Merciful to her. Everyone around them, what did they do? They rejoiced. They were sharing the joy with this couple who had been through so much disappointment, even probably despair, uh, struggling, you know, wondering if they've been forgotten at times, and now, and now they have this, this precious little boy, right? And, and it says this, uh, we, no, we don't, they've been waiting for a long time in their lives. Now they have this baby. Now, now, we'll not say what his name is yet. Many of you already know this. But we'll get to his name in just a minute. But according to Jewish custom, what would happen is after the eighth day, the, the male children would be circumcised as a part of that Jewish culture. And that is when that child, that baby would be given their name. They would be named at that point. So at this point, it's just the baby. Okay? And, and so the baby is, is born. Eight days goes by. Now... Zechariah still doesn't have a whole lot to say at this point. <laughs> you may be, well, why? Why is he being quiet about this? If you weren't here, I'll, I'll fill you in in just a second about what was going on. But he has not talked since before the conception of this child. And if you'll recall, let me just catch you up. If you weren't here and maybe just remind you what was going on, he is one of the priests. He's from the line of Abijah. Elizabeth is also from a priestly line, and there would be thousands of priests that were all over the country of Israel, and they would often travel into Jerusalem, the main city there, where they would, 
they would come to the temple, and here's just an image of what Herod's temple would have looked like. It was massive, okay? Sits on Mount Moriah, uh, incidentally, where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac as God called him to. It's all the same there. I want you to see, on the outside, there's the court of the Gentiles. That's for people to come and, and, and uh, who aren't Jews, and they could come into that temple, and they could offer up, what? Prayers. And they'd be seeking to know more about Yahweh, the God of the Jews. And now when you get into the middle part, you've got the part that is the court of the women because the women and men would worship separately and the women would worship and they would, they would pray also. And then on the inside is the court of Israel. That's where the men who were not priests would also come and they would pray. And then you also have a, a little closer to what is called the Holy of Holies. You have the holy place. And this is where the priest would go in. And the priest would, would go through and, and they, would, they would burn incense. And this incense would begin to, to flow up like, as it was burning, like the prayers of the people. And then, of course, you had a veil between even the priests. That only one time a year, the high priest would go in and he would make a sacrifice on behalf of all the people. Okay, that's where the Ark of the Covenant, box of promise, the box of God's promises. So people are praying, and Zechariah, he gets picked. It's a once-in-a-lifetime event. He, he gets picked by lottery system among all of these thousands of priests to go in and to burn this incense. And they would do this a couple of times a day, and maybe it looked kind of like this. Now, keep in mind that while people were praying, okay, and, and, uh, and this is kind of what it would look like, and you see that, that incense that's going up to the heavens, and again, representation of the prayers of people who have been waiting for a long time. Waiting for what? A Messiah, the deliverer, the rescuer. Now, the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, wasn't written back then, but it was of that mentality. God with us, come, we need you, Lord, because go back to the temple image. What you see in the temple is people are in there praying, okay? And then you've got in that upper corner over there, you've got the Antonia Fortress there. And that is where Rome, who was, had conquered Israel at this point, were occupying them. And there would be up to 600 soldiers that would be based out of that, that would be stationed there. And the Roman soldiers, while the Jews were praying, the Roman soldiers would be looking over the wall and they'd be laughing, mocking, mocking you while you pray, making obscene gestures. How, how's that prayer working out for you guys? How do you like this? Because you're a, you're a conquered people. You can pray all you want. So these people are stuck between the promise and they're stuck between this place of disappointment and despair. And we talked about that a few weeks ago. And m maybe you can relate to this. They've been waiting. It's been 400 years since they have heard from God. And, and, and so people are drifting from God. People are moving away from God. God, they're in this period of waiting. And you might identify because waiting stinks, doesn't it? Especially in a... In a world that we live in that's just all about instant gratification, we want what we want and we want it now. And we live in a society that is so fast-paced. And when we don't get it, when we want it, we struggle, right? And so Zechariah, this old guy, he, he ends up going in to the, to the holy place, not the most holy place, but the holy place, offering the incense, and then he has an encounter with Gabriel, Gabriel, the archangel, and he is terrified. It scares him to death. I mean, he, he's like so overwhelmed by this. And Gabriel says to him, fear not. I bring you some good news, Zechariah. I bring you some good news because your wife, Elizabeth, she is going to have a son. And he is, I know you've been waiting for this for a long time. He is a special boy that you're gonna have. This special one you're going to have is he's gonna do something significant. He is going to begin to clear the path and get God's people ready for 
the Messiah's arrival. He's not the Messiah, but he's the one who is going to do something special. He's going to call God's people to come home. Come home to me. This is what he's going to do. And then he says something that's very significant. He says, and you are to name him what? Come on. John. Not Zechariah, which we'll get to that in a second, but John. John means graced by God. You've been graced to have this child. God's been merciful to you. You've been blessed. And, and now we would think at this point that this would be where Zechariah would be like, praise the Lord. I knew you were going to do it, God. But what does he do? He does what most of us would do. He's like, what? Have you seen how old Elizabeth is? Are you, are you crazy, Gabriel? This doesn't make any sense. And in fact, you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to give me some kind of sign. And Gabriel's like, do you know who you're talking to? I mean, you, you don't even get to go behind the veil. You're on the other side. I'm in the presence of God himself. And he sent me to give you this news. And this is how you receive this, you doubt. Here's what's gonna happen. You're still gonna name him John and he's still gonna be great and you're still gonna have a lot of joy. But you, sir, are gonna zip it for a while. And so he comes out and he's, he's in there for a while and people are like, the old guy, he's taking way too long. What's he doing? He probably, he probably tripped on something. He's fallen. He can't get up, whatever, okay? And, but he's like, you're, 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 gonna, you're gonna have this baby, but it's gonna be an interesting scenario for you. There'll be no talking from you until I say. And so he's quiet. He comes out, he's gesturing an angel, right? He can't say it. They're like, what? What's going on? It's having a baby, whatever, you know, I don't know. And, uh, and then, okay, he finishes out his service, which I think is really cool. He's supposed to be there for a while. He doesn't just go, I'm done. He finishes. And then he conceives with Elizabeth and the special baby is born. The time had finally come. Nine months goes by. And people are, are hearing about this. People are excited. Uh, the family rejoices with the mercy that God shows them. Now, now, again, think with me. This baby is born and Zechariah still can't talk. He's still in this place where he, I imagine he's smiling really big though. But he can't talk yet. Still no words. People are probably like, Z, what do you think about this, man? He's probably like, Whatever, you know, but he can't talk. He's got nine months of pent up praise. I can't wait to praise what God is doing. I'm watching him do it before my very eyes. It's unfolding in front of me and I can't say anything about it. That must have been hard for a preacher. So this baby is born. He's smiling away. Eight days old. Look with me in verse 59. When the baby was eight days old, they all came for the circumcision ceremony. The community would gather. This was a special occasion, all right? It was, a, it was like a, a very special baby dedication. By the way, I've had three pregnant moms say, you can dedicate our babies, you can't hold our babies, okay, since I dropped the baby in the first service. But, but when the baby was eight days old, they all came for the circumcision ceremony and they, the people, the leaders in the community, wanted to name him what? Zechariah after his father. They didn't have the benefit of having the baby name book. What were the most you know, popular names, the trendy names right now? It was just kind of a given that you name that child after the father or after someone in that family. And the, and the dad couldn't talk. And so they're like, I guess we'll just name him Zechariah Jr., which would have been really unfortunate because Zechariah Jr., the Baptist, doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? Okay? It doesn't quite work the way that JTB does. But, um, and so Elizabeth at this point is like, no, 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 no. Elizabeth said, no, his name is what? John. His name is John. We got told what we were supposed to name him. It is John. And now they're like, what? You people are so weird. 
You're old, you're having babies. When you're old, you won't name them what you're supposed to name them. You're just, this is all just too much. It's too strange. They exclaim, there's no one in all of your family by that name. They're like, this is just a weird deal. Now, my dad's name is Patrick O'Neill. Now you know if you were here a while back about my lucky charms, why I like it. It's a good Irish name, right? My middle name is Patrick. In fact, if we get coffee somewhere or order food and they ask for a name, I don't give the name Bart. So don't, that, that may surprise you. I've had a few like, what? Your name's Patrick? And I'm like, yeah, because whenever I say Bart, I don't know if I mumble, but they never get it right. <laughs> In fact, the last time they put me over the edge was at a coffee shop. It was order for bark, <laughs> roof, right? Yeah, that's my name, Bark Howell, seriously. <laughs> I'm like, never again. Patrick, that's what I go by, all right? Um, my son, Luke, his middle name is Patrick, Luke Patrick. Um, we just kind of do this, it's not... You know, we don't have to do this in America, but a lot of us do that. You may have your father's name, or my daughter, Trinity, is named, uh, she's Trinity, but her middle name is Renee. Her aunt, her middle name is Renee. My niece, she's Savannah Hope, and Hope is her aunt. And so, anyhow, we kind of do this, but in that culture, it wasn't if we kind of want to, that's what was expected. This is what you do, Okay. And, and so here we are, now these men probably of the village are like, no, we, we can't be John, you're messing this up, Elizabeth. So they start trying to mansplain to her that this is how we do this. You know this is how this goes down. And so they're like, let's just go try to talk to Zechariah. She's messing this up, okay? And once he's named, that's going to mess everything up if we don't ha- give the right name. So verse 62, so they used gestures, this verse kind of cracks me up because nowhere does it say that he couldn't hear. (laughs) They're like, right, question mark, what's the baby's name going to be, right? And so, you know, kind of like if you're talking to someone maybe that doesn't speak English and you can't understand them and you start speaking louder to them and they're going, that's not helping. Um, So here's kind of what's going on. They used gestures to ask the baby's father what he wanted to name him. And uh, so he's like, gets his writing tablet. So apparently he's been communicating, but he still, his vocal cords are seized up. And he gets it and he writes, turns it around. What's the name? John. Graced by God. That's this boy's name. Don't you dare try to name him something else. And it says this. His name is John. To everyone's surprise, he wrote his name is John. Instantly, Zechariah could speak again. And he began praising God. This priest, this preacher hasn't been able to praise God for nine months vocally like this. I don't know what he said, but what do you think you would say? Praise the Lord not just that I can talk again. Praise the Lord that you did and are doing what you said you were gonna do. And you have invited my family to be a part of this process. Yes, his name is John. And yes, he is gonna be a great one because you said he would be, Lord. I mean, I don't know what he's saying, but he's overwhelmed. It had to have been quite emotional. He's going to be the one to get everybody ready in Israel for the first coming of the Messiah. He's going to be used by the Lord to do this. And I want you to see verse 65, okay? All wonder fell upon the whole neighborhood. And the, uh, and the news of what had happened started spreading. It's like wildfire through the Judean hills. The joy is starting to spread. People are starting to talk where they've been talking about maybe their shame, They can't have kids. What's wrong with them? Now they're talking about, look at what God did. Look at what God has done. God's been faithful. And there's something special about this kid. This whole thing's been really very unusual. People are talking. People are in awe of God. People are starting to get hopeful. Maybe he's the one. Maybe he's going to be the one that's going to 
Deliver us from these Romans who are mocking us and oppressing us and taxing us out of our homes where we can't even feed our families. Maybe he's going to be the rescuer, this guy's baby. Here's what it says. Everyone heard about it, reflected on these events, verse 66, and asked, what will this child turn out to be? What will he turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was surely upon him in a, what? Special way. This child's special. This was indeed a special baby. People were saying, man, there's something happening here. God's up to something. God's doing something. We sense it. We've been waiting. We're ready. We're hungry, Lord. We're ready for you to do something. Now, now who is this, who's this baby going to grow up to be? Fast forward with me about 30 years. So as we go about 30 years out, there's this, there's this young man, around 30 years old, who is now out in the Judean wilderness. He's out in the wilderness and he's got a message and he's starting to, to it's resonating with people and people, just a few start coming at first, but then it, word starts spreading. There's something going on with this guy and he's, he's gonna be preaching to people and, and he's gonna say something to the people of Israel who are still waiting for their Messiah. They're still waiting. They're still struggling. They're still hurting. But this guy's gonna say, Prepare your hearts. You need to get ready. And then he's going to use a word that a lot of times pastors don't like to use today. And I don't know why. It's not an offensive word. It's a beautiful word. He uses this word, repent. And this word, repent, in the original language, it means change your mind about all of this, about your life. Change your mind. And as you change your mind, your heart changes. As your heart changes, your actions change. Your words change. As you change your mind about who God is in your life, your life changes. And this is this word. And he says, I'm here to prepare the way of the Lord. And then he's going to say this essentially. You've been waiting for a long time. Some of you have drifted away. Some of you have gotten apathetic in your waiting Come home to God. Come home. He starts inviting. Come home. Come home. His, his message is so powerful. The crowds start growing around him. People are so spiritually hungry. I kind of think it may be a little bit like it is now. People are spiritually hungry. You know that, right? They're hungry. They're, they're needing some hope in their life. These people were They've been waiting for so long. And, and, and they're like, okay, John, you're saying get ourselves ready. What are we supposed to do? How do we do that? What do you mean get ready? Get ready for who and how? If you flip over a few pages to, in the Gospel of Luke to chapter 3, verse 8, this is what John will say as he's preaching to them. And this is a word for us today as we wait between Advents. As we wait in the first coming and we wait in the second coming, as we get our hearts ready, this is what he says, verse 8. How do we get ready? Prove by the way you live. Do you see that? Prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins. It's not lip service. You're not just going through the motions. There's a life change that is happening. Prove by the way that you live, that you've repented of your sins, and you have turned to God. And then he goes on, and he says, don't just say to each other, I really love this, we're safe, we're good, we're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. Hang on to that. Here's what he says. Yeah, you may be, but that means nothing. That means nothing, for I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Let me tell you the kind of the gist of his message. Stop depending upon grandma's faith. Your faith needs to become your own. Amen, right? Stop also pretending. Stop being a faker. Start being a follower. Your, your words should begin to match up, right, with the way that you live your life. This is what he's getting at here, right? But many are just like, yeah, but, 
but grandma's faith, I just kind of bank on that, or that's what these Jews had been doing for Abraham, their great descendant. We're children of Abraham, and you just heard what he said. God doesn't care. God's, God's looking at, at your relationship with him right now. Who are you not banking on what happened with grandma or grandpa? So here's what the people do. He's like, people start getting moved by this. And then they're like, what do we do? How do, how do we respond? Look at what he says. The crowds ask, what should we do? John, we're listening to you, but how do we respond to this practically? What are you telling us to do? How do we get ourselves ready for his coming? This is what he says. John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even, I love this, even the corrupt tax collectors who were hated, the, they were the worst of sinners, they were attracted to what was going on with John. They even start coming and they're like, well, what do we do? Is it possible for us to get to know this Messiah? Will he come for us too? What do, what do we do? And he replied, collect no more taxes than the government requires. Soldiers at that time ask, what should we do? How do we, how do we respond to this? John replied, stop extorting people. Don't extort money. Quit making false accusations against people and using and abusing your power over people that you have. What he's saying is, and then I love this next part, oh, and be content with what you're getting paid. The reason he says that is because the reason people extort and the reason people get greedy and selfish, they're not content. And so you start doing whatever you can do to benefit yourself. What's he saying? Stop being selfish. Stop thinking only about yourself. Start thinking about other people, right? Stop taking advantage of people. Stop loving money so much. Be content in a relationship with God, repent, get your heart right, because he's coming soon. He's coming soon. That sounds like pretty good advice while we wait for the second time. Amen? <laughs> Treat people right. Let your, your life match what you say you believe. God's looking for people who are followers, not fakes. It's so interesting. So people would come to him and they would walk up and he would start baptizing them. He would plunge them under water, baptizo, and then pull them back up out of the water. And it was this representation of a life that is gone and a new life, a cleansing, so to speak, okay? And people were coming to him in the droves for this. Thus the name John the Baptizer. He's the baptizer, and so uh, this is what he would do. Now, now the, here, so John is starting to get really popular. People are, crowds are growing around him. They're, they're hungry for change. They're hungry for a Messiah. Verse 15 in this passage says, everyone was expecting, everyone, in fact, will you read that with me? Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon. I read that this week. And I thought, that's interesting that they were, they were, they've been cultivated for this. They were expecting the Messiah to come in the first advent. And the question that struck me this week, church, listen to me. There is a second coming. Are we expecting him to come again soon? Are we living in that manner? Or have we grown apathetic? Because, I mean, frankly, 2,000 years has been a while, Right? But we just need to understand that God's, and we'll see, God's timing is different than ours. But we are to live, we are to live in this, this mindset of preparation with an understanding that he is coming again. And, and, and in the meantime, we're, we're stuck in the middle between, between the first and the second advent. And so people are like, man, this guy's special. This guy's changing lives. Could he be the guy? Could he be the Messiah? People are in this place of despair. They're spiritually hungry. This song wasn't around, but, but this is the mentality. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Emmanuel means what? God 
with us. And ransom captive Israel. We're so hungry for your coming, God. We feel forgotten. Some of you, maybe you can identify with that. When are you coming, Lord? How long, oh Lord? That's where they were at. And so at that point, they're like, it's got to be John. He's got to be the one. John answered their questions. Are, are you the one, John? This is what he says in verse 16. <laughs> he said, man, I baptize you with water. This is just water. But someone is coming soon who is, what does it say? Greater than I am. Greater than I am. So much greater. John says, I'm not even worthy to be his slave. I'm not even, I'm not even worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire. Here's what John is saying. I'm not the Savior. I was thinking this week, that's probably not a bad thing for you and I as we stand in front of the mirror every morning to remind ourselves of. In fact, say it with me. I'm not the Savior. Say it with me. I'm not the Savior. Number one, it takes the pressure off of you to change people's lives because you're not the Savior. Because the reality is, you and I, we cannot even save ourselves. We need a Savior to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. I'm not the Savior. So now Jesus, his cousin, shows up on the scene. Jesus is walking along the shores of the Jordan. He's ready to begin his ministry. It hasn't started yet, but he's going to humbly lead through this baptism. And John sees him. They lock eyes, and John says, look. Next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look. In other words, behold, that's him. He's here. People were like, what? That's the carpenter's son. What? No, look, the Lamb of God. This was so significant that John said the Lamb of God because they understood that these lambs would be used in a sacrifice. In fact, in the, in the Exodus story, Moses told the people to, what did he tell them to do? To sacrifice a lamb, take the blood, put it over the doorpost, and the angel of death would pass over a sacrifice, right, to cover others. And John says, that's the Lamb of God. That's the lamb, look, who takes away the sin of the world. Not just the sins of Israel. When John was saying this, he was prophesying over you 2,000 years later, over me, that he could also take away my sins and your sins, amen? That I could now be clean, that I could now be in this relationship with the loving Father that I was created for, you too. John is at the pinnacle of his popularity, and people are coming to Jesus now. And, and Jesus is starting to heal, and, and his, John, some of his followers are getting jealous. They're like, man, this isn't right. They're going, to, we're dwindling. He's starting to get more popular. People are coming to him. And you know what John does? John, because he's a kingdom guy, because he understood what his mission was and is, Here's what he says these powerful words. He says to his followers, and they speak to us today, he must increase, I must decrease. Another good thought and lesson to learn from John the Baptist. He's the Savior, I'm not. He must increase, I must decrease. I gotta remind myself of that every day because... The way I'm inclined to live my life, like you probably are, is I must increase. Because it's in our nature, isn't it? To build ourselves up, to preserve, to think only of ourselves. This week I was uh, on a trail run at Eagle Mountain Park and enjoying the day. And, and I was thinking about Advent. And I was thinking about this message 
And I didn't hear an audible voice from God, but I, as I was running along and I was praying, and part of my prayer was, God, help me. I can't run as I used to could, okay? Help me, God. But part of the prayer was also this, Lord. And I was thinking about this message, and, and I felt the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, speak into my soul. And, and here's the question as I was thinking about the first coming and the second coming. The question as I thought about John the Baptist, and I think about this. Bart, are you faithfully getting people ready for my second coming the way John got people ready for the first coming? Are you preparing the way? Are you calling people to get their hearts ready? I want you to see that John's purpose was to prepare the way and to point people to Jesus. That's what, that's what his life was about. And when anybody would try to get him off of that mission, he would correct them. No, he must increase. I need to decrease. Right? And, and here's, here's the, really the question that struck me that day, this week. Am I a bridge or a barricade for people to come home to God? Am I a bridge by the way that I live, by my actions, by my words? Am I a br- more of a bridge like John was this bridge for people to come home to God? People started coming and, and, and coming to him and they were hungry spiritually. They were getting baptized. Am I a bridge like that guy or more like the Pharisees? It's a blockade. The religious leaders of the time that were blocking people from coming to God. I think it's a question that every follower of Christ, we should ask ourselves. I think that every church should ask, are we a church that is a bridge for people to come to God or are we blocking people from coming to God by our actions? Because he, he was saying li- literally to them, your lives need to match what you say you believe. And if it doesn't, you're a blockade. And I think we know how true this is. Is there hypocrisy in my life? Is there a lack of contentment that we all struggle with, right? Is there, this is not a call for perfection. This is just a call for authenticity. It's a call just to be real. It's a call to be genuine. It's a call to, in humility, recognize your own brokenness and my brokenness and understand that only God can save us and that he must increase, we must decrease always here at this church, in our lives. And then the, another thought hit me that day. Well, you're like, man, that's a tall task to uh, be able to kind of help people come home to God. I don't know if I can do that. And on your own, you probably cannot. On my own, I can't. The scripture tells us that John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit, even in his mother's womb, which was kind of wild. And then I thought this. I have been born again. And if you are in Jesus Christ, my friends, you have been born again. And one of the benefits of that is God himself has deposited the Holy Spirit in you to help you, if you will, die to yourself, to help you die to yourself daily and and just be you and let him work through you to be a bridge for people to come to God. He uniquely made you this way, and the Holy Spirit is the one who changes lives. So go back with me 30 years, okay? We went forward into John's life. Now go back to when he is a baby. Zechariah can now praise. And so he's had a lot of time to reflect. He's had a lot of time to think about things. So he writes a song. It's called the Benedictus because the first words are praise the Lord. But he's been thinking about this. His silence ends, and he's going to make a prophecy. It's a song, and this is what he says, and I'll just go through it quickly. Back to Luke chapter 1, verse 67. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Here it is. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed. That's to buy back out of slavery. Redeemed his people. It's interesting because Jesus hadn't been born yet, right? Jesus was getting ready to be born, but God's getting people ready. He has sent us a mighty savior from the royal line of his servant, David. Here's what he's saying. God keeps his promises. He said he was going to do it. It may not be on your times, you know, table, but he keeps his promises. He says, just as he promised 
through his holy prophets long ago. Now, this is the guy that said, have you seen Elizabeth? Have you seen me? We're old now. This guy's saying, no, look, we will be saved from our enemies. Now, I don't know if he understood the depth of what he was saying there. He maybe did because the Holy Spirit's revealing this to him. But a lot of the Jews didn't understand that and still don't. Their enemies at that point was Rome. But what was really being said was a greater enemy, which is what? Our sin that separates us from our God. But there's one who's coming. He's coming to redeem us out of that. There's one who's coming who will pay the price for us, who will bridge that gap, who will make it possible to be in relationship with God and be restored, redeemed, ransomed. And it says he's been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant. The covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. He's going back 2,000 years. It's about the same amount of time, right, since the first advent and where we are today. But he's saying, no, he promised it a long time ago. And he promised 2,000 years ago that he's coming again. And a big question is, are you ready for that? Is your heart ready? I've been asking people, are you ready for Christmas? And I, I know I most kind of think that I'm talking about um, all the things that we do. What I really mean is, are you ready for Christmas? Are you ready to celebrate the first coming while we wait for his second coming? In eager anticipation And then he goes on and he says, we've been rescued from our enemies so we can serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness. And now he's going to turn to his little baby boy and he's holding him in his arms, I imagine, at this point. And this is John the Baptist as a baby. And he says, and you, my little son, you will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people. Remember, Like John, are we like John? You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. They felt like they were in darkness. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and guide us to, isn't this what we're supposed to be doing for people in this In this world today, guide us to the path of what? Peace. People want peace in their life. Guide us to this path of peace. And then then he says this. It says, John grew up, became strong in spirit, and he lived in the, what's the word? Wilderness. Do you think? This sometimes feels like the wilderness. We have the hope, right? But boy, there are a lot of disappointments. There's a lot of struggle. Sometimes there's even despair. Right? And this closes out. This time I really believe that we live in between the first advent and the second advent, it's like a wilderness. We have a relationship with God, but you know just as well as I do that there's still a lot of pain that's going on in many of your lives. There's still some suffering. There's still waiting, isn't there? Waiting stinks. While we wait, we're in this wilderness, and when this chapter closes out, it should evoke some emotions within you. He does me, and there should be some things that kind of resonate within me, and there's just, again, some application for you today, okay, as we wrap this up. There, there's some things that I want you to see, these impressions about this story. Number one, it's an impression of God's mercy. Zechariah and Elizabeth, it says, they experience the mercy of God. People rejoice about his mercy. That, that word mercy, it speaks of this, this pursuing love of God. That even when you can't see him working, like he's loyal, steadfast, and, and he, he was pursuing them. So it's a story of mercy. Zechariah brought up mercy a couple of times, his tender mercy. And as I was thinking about this, in my position as pastor, as a pastor to many of you, sometimes it's a daily occurrence, maybe a weekly occurrence, but I hear from you oftentimes 
some of the hardest things that people go through in their lives. A lot of times I don't get people telling me about the good things, just being honest. I, most of the time people are saying, this is the hardest time in my life. Will you pray for me? And obviously I will. And as I think about what some of you go through, what some of you are going through, one of the things that I want you to know that I pray for you and I pray over you today is that wherever you are in your season of waiting, that you also experience the tender mercies of our God. Because I'm not the Savior. But we have one who came for you, and his name is Emmanuel. And he hasn't come back the second time yet, but he said he is. But in the meantime, do you know what he said because of what he did on the cross? I will never forsake you. And I'm with you. I'm with you. It's a story, and some of you are like, I get it, Bart. I love it. Thank you. I receive the mercy of the Lord. I hope I get to experience that. But do you know how long I've been waiting? Probably not. Some of you, yes, but probably not. So here's the other impression. It's a story of patience. It's a story of, of patience. I don't know if we've realized this, but God doesn't seem to be on our schedule. Does it bug you? It bugs me. But he's not. He's not in a hurry. And what this tells me is sovereignly he's working things together. That's what we know and we have to lean into and believe that he's working even while we're waiting. And he's doing things. What this story shows us is that our God shows up in the lives of unexpected people in unexpected times doing unexpected things. And that's who he is. And we don't like it. Your scenario, you're behind someone at the red light. The lady is on her phone. The red light changes to green. One, 1,000. <laughs> Two, 1,000. Now the only question is, does she get the honk, honk, which is nice, or the eh, which is a horn cussing, okay? <laughs> we don't like to wait. God, I've been praying about this, and I know it's been maybe a few years, maybe your whole lifetime in the grand scheme of God. This is a story of patience. And here's the final thing. It's a story of growth. Zechariah went in nine months. He's an old guy from, have you seen me and my wife? We're old. To his name is John. And this is what I want you to hear, and I'm not going to lock eyes with anybody here, okay, because I might offend you. God does love to work through young people. But I see in the Bible a lot of times God loves to work through old people people. <laughs> I love it. Don't you love that? I saw thumbs up for some some, okay? He loves to work through old people. They were very old. Moses was 80 when God called him. Do you know that? 80. Um, Abraham was old. And again, God loves to work through everybody, but he, he does. And so here's what this means for us, for all of us, no matter what your age, is this. Because here's what happens sometimes as we get older, we get apathetic and we think either, number one, I have arrived and have nothing else to learn, or we feel as we are older, I have nothing else to offer. And this is just not true. God picks some old people to do something very significant to get people ready for the Messiah. And um, last picture, this is my Aunt Helen who is now 91 years old. And Aunt Helen grew up in church. She grew up a church kid, went to church her whole life. But when she was 87, she says, the Lord woke her up in the middle of the night and she realized that she had been a religious person but didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
She went and talked to her pastor. She was disturbed by this. And her pastor shared the gospel with her. She got saved. And she said, I want to get baptized. 87 years old when she gets baptized. We have the video. I won't show it to you, but it was beautiful. And that, again, just says, don't ever stop growing. Go into this Christmas season not with, oh, I've heard it all or whatever. What if you went in like, Lord, here I am. Teach me something new today. I maybe have heard it 50 times. Teach me something new. I want to wait in wonder of you. Let's pray. Some of you have never put your faith in Jesus. Maybe you're like my Aunt Helen. You've grown up in church. You know the answers, the Sunday school answers, whatever. But you realize today that you, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But I want you to know that he came for you. He loves you. He came to set you free of your sin and to give you eternal life and to be in your life right now. And in faith, you can, you can say, I receive you, Jesus, as my Savior. I want a relationship with you. Save me, Lord. Rescue me from my sin. And I want to follow you. I don't know how many days left I have on this earth, but Lord, I want to follow you every day of my life. I turn from my old life. I turn to you. Put your faith in Jesus as your Savior in faith. You can't earn it. You're not the Savior. He came to do it for you by grace through faith. Today, if you trust Jesus as your Savior, I'd encourage you to let somebody know. You might come t tell me at the end of the service or one of our pastors. Maybe you don't know anybody. I, I encourage you to text 94000, text EVC follow. One of our pastors would love to help you in this journey of understanding who Emmanuel is to you in your life. If you're a believer, are you preparing the way? Are you a bridge or are you a barricade? Maybe there's an area of your life that you just need to bring to the Lord and just humbly just bring before God today. Father, we, we love you. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you that you are Emmanuel, that you are our rescuer. Prepare our hearts and help us to prepare the hearts of our family and others as we celebrate your first coming while we wait for your second coming. In Jesus' name, amen.